Okay, I think we should start. Uh, Alexander will be here in a minute. So he introduced the uh, uh, last topic of lecture four yesterday. Right, this was about like uh, belief merge or an knowledge merge. Right, so how can agents uh, uh, reach an agreement by uh, sharing the information that they have? So by merging the plausibility relations or the plausibility structure of each of the agents. Okay, so that's a nice topic. A particular scenario would be this, right? So if two agents, Albert and Mary, Albert has some specific type of knowledge. For instance, he knows he's drunk or a genius. He believes he's a genius, conditional on somebody telling him that he's drunk. He will believe not genius. All right, so that's Albert's scenario, and Mary, she doesn't know D or G, but she believes Albert's drunk. Madam, and the idea would be that those two agents are going to share their information. And for instance, one particular way to do it is that, okay, we look at who has more knowledge. Well, it's Albert in this case. He really knows D or G, so if they talk or they communicate, then Mary should adapt at least should adopt the same type of knowledge that Albert has. So together, what we want is that they know D or G. And we also want that both would believe D. If we give priority to Mary, because she believes D, okay, so then Albert should adopt this belief of Mary, D. And we know that conditional on D, he believes not G. So we put that together, and then both should believe D and not G. That's like one particular way in which the beliefs and the knowledge is merged, right? Where we give priority to the beliefs of Mary. Um, so in general, what we're after is like um, the agents want to reach a goal. So they want to share their information and the goal is some kind of like uh, epistemic or docastic agreement. Of course, there are different types of agreements. So they can either focus only on merging their knowledge, their strong beliefs, or their safe beliefs, their, their defeasible type of knowledge, or only the weak beliefs, right? And depending on the type of agreement to be reached, so there are specific strategies. So what strategy should these agents follow in order to reach the type of goal that they have in mind? And what we're interested in here is a particular type of sharing of information. So. And the particular type of sharing is the one induced by sincere, persuasive, and public communication. So no cheating going on, and everything is supposed to be public. I mean, the scenario and the setting in real life can become much more complicated, right, if you weaken these conditions. So, but let's start to make it easy, and we really are looking for uh, public communication, which means that it's common knowledge of what is announced by each of the agents, so everything is public, and also like um, and the same attitude towards the announcement is reached by all the agents in the end. Sincerity, by that we mean that the communicated information was already accepted by the agent, right? So if I'm saying that uh, phi, depending that I want to really merge my beliefs, then I really need to believe it myself. And by persuasiveness, we mean that the new information really becomes commonly accepted by the group at the end. So the, the goal here is that they reach their um, agreement, right? So they merge their information, and then no further information should be merged. It's like a total agreement is reached in the end. So whatever further communication happens, uh, depending on the type of agreement that we're after, no further, nothing would be left uh, to be merged. And then the question would be what type of merge can be dynamically realized by what type of sharing, right? And, and there are things that are known in the literature, and namely the questions you can ask is does the communication agenda, the order of the items in which the agents make their announcements, uh, does that matter? And also the order of the speakers, does the order of the speakers matter? And these are things that have been studied in political science and in other types of literature, and the answer is yes, of course. Depending on the type of merge that we're looking at, the order of the items on the agenda is going to matter, and the order of the uh, speakers is going to, to matter. Okay, so this topic has been studied in social choice theory, and those who have been to Eric Packett's class uh, 
have learned more about it already. So there, one of the main issues is how to merge the agent's preference relations. Now we're talking about plausibility models, but those things are very similar to like uh, the notion of a preference relation that's being used in social choice theory. So in social choice theory, there are studying merge operations for groups of agents where, um, where each preference relation R would be like uh, the specific preference for one specific agent and you merge that for a whole group and then you take some specific merge operation. Now, and the problem of finding what a natural merge operation is um, really has been studied here, right? And so depending on the conditions, there are known impossibility terms in the literature, and that refers to Arrow's theorem, 1950, or there are also like possible classifications of possible types of merge that you can reach. And an important paper here is a paper of Andrika, Ryan, and Scobbins in 2002, where they study specific types of possible merge. And actually those classification of possible types of the paper of Andrika and Ryan and Scobbins is what we're using also for our plausibility merge in the setting that uh, the belief merge that we're studying here. So if we want to merge the agent's beliefs, what do we have to do? Then we have to merge, of course, the belief relation, right? Or the underlying plausibility relation. If you want to, err, uh, to merge the agent's knowledge, the hard, the, so the hard information, what you have to do is merge the indistinguishability relations for each of the agents. And if you want to merge all the soft information, like strong beliefs or conditional beliefs, then you look at all the the whole setting, the whole plausibility relations. Okay. So it really depends what we're after. Now in the literature on social choice theory, what we see there is one specific type of merge has been studied and that's called parallel merge. And the parallel merge just takes the intersection of the preference relations of each of the agents. Now that is a useful one and we can use that too for our um, um, merging our um, plausibility setting. Now, in this case, if you take the intersection of the relations, then that means this is absolutely, um, that's a type of merge which is good in case there is no inconsistency possible, right? So you take the intersection of the relations, which means that this better be information that's totally compatible with each other, right? So whatever Alice says or whatever Bob says, we take the intersection of the relations, so it has to be compatible. This means that this is particularly suited when we're merging knowledge hard knowledge, which is truth, uh, truthful anyway. So this is a very good way to merging uh, knowledge when there is no danger of having any inconsistencies. Okay, and what does that realize when we take the intersection of the equivalence relations for each of the agents, right, for the knowledge relation? Then what we realize is a notion of distributed knowledge. So that's just the standard notion of distributed knowledge that we've seen. So that's one way of realizing distributed knowledge. Another type of merge that has been studied in the, in the literature is the one in which um, what they call a lexicographic merge and where a priority is given to one of the agents. So we have a hierarchy now among the agents in the group. So somebody um, gets the priority to speak first and that, uh, that agent's plausibility relation will have preference over the other one. So we're not taking just the intersection here, but we really are looking first at the order of one of the agents and then at the order of the other agents. So in this case, it's possible that, um, that there are some inconsistencies, right? So this is particularly nice when we're trying to merge the belief relations. So for the knowledge relations, then we had to make sure that if we take the intersection there, that there are no possible inconsistencies. But when we do the lexicographic merge, indeed, because we know that for beliefs, beliefs can be false, right? So if you merge them, I mean, you really have to like look at who believes what, as in the example that I gave first, where we had like a priority given to the beliefs of Mary. Okay, so indeed, for merging soft information that's not fully reliable, some screening, screening off has to be applied to ensure the consistency of the merge. And for that one, the lexicographic merge that they've studied in the literature is really nice. Now, the lexicographic merge is the one that we've studied in the absence of any hard information. Right? So first I looked at merging knowledge, and then I look at like uh, 
merging the plausibility relation. Now, the, what we call the relative priority merge is the one in which um, uh, when we first we look at the setting in which we have both hard information, so both knowledge and beliefs of the agent. And in this case, in the presence of hard information, the lexicographic merge of the previous setting has to be modified. So what we, first, what we have to do in this setting is first we pull together all the hard information of the agent. So first we look at what they really know, the things that are consistent with each other. And then we merge that, and for that one we use the merge by intersection. And after that, uh, everything else that's left to be merged, for that one we use the lexicographic merge, and we have to give the priority to one of the agents in the group following the hierarchy. Right? So what we call relative priority merge really is a combination of the intersection and the lexicographic merge. Now, I'm not explaining all the details of how the relations are merged. I'll leave that for you to, uh, to look at the slides. But the idea is just that you look at who has priority and then... Um, so first you merge all the knowledge and then um, you go further. Okay, so let's look at a specific example. Now we're merging, so remember the example of Albert Weinstein and Mary Curry, right? So each of them has a specific plausibility relation. So they have the, the top one is the model for Mary, and the bottom one is the model for Albert. And now we're trying to um, merge the two. Well, indeed, we give priority to Mary, right? So there's a group hierarchy here, and Mary has priority. So following to what we already said, what should we do? So first... So this is the one for the group where here they should be labeled by both Mary and Al. So this is the one for both when they have reached an agreement. Okay. So what we do first is we look at hard knowledge. Hard knowledge means that Albert here has like a distinguished setting here for this one and has a uh, information class here and that one. So that's separated. So this means Mary has to adopt the same thing. Right? So she cuts the model here for her as well. So they both adopt that. Then they have to merge their plausibility relation. And to do that, we look first at Mary. So Mary says all the D-worlds are on top of all the not D-worlds. So indeed, this is something that has to be into the end result. All the D-worlds has to be on top of all the not D-worlds. After Albert does that, so Albert has a little bit more information here. Since within the D-zones, he put G on top of not G. <coughs> so that has to be like uh, done as well, right? So. Here, not G, uh, no. in the D zone, not G is on top of G. So on the end result, Mary will have to adopt together with Albert uh, that not G is on top of G. So using this kind of like um, strategy for merging, then this is, this is a specific result. And of course, here indeed, all the communication that they are doing in order to reach that agreement has to be public. Right? So there's no private communication going on in case there would be more agents that would probably be, make sense. Now you can realize these merges dynamically, right? So this means that uh, what we're after is these agents have to perform a sequence of uh, updates and upgrades, transforming their initial model into this final model, right? So exactly the type of uh, upgrade operations that we have studied before are the ones that we're going to use. So in case of knowledge, it's easy to design a protocol to realize uh, distributed knowledge, right? So in this case, um, we, <coughs> as the parallel merge of the agents, that's the type of merge that we're using for them to um, uh, push for distributed knowledge in the end. And what is the protocol? The protocol is that in no particular order, the agents really have to publicly, sincerely announce in an infallible manner everything they know. Right? So you can write that out. So for all the agents in the group, so that's the, the big the thing on the top here, everybody has to announce, so bank P, where P is the thing that every agent knows. Right? So for every agent I, whatever that agent knows, he has to announce everything he knows. And then all the agents have to do that. And now that we're merging the, <coughs> the knowledge of the agents, it doesn't matter in which order that this is done because knowledge has to be truthful, so there is no possible inconsistency to arise in this matter. Okay. 
And indeed, these announcements can be interleaving, right? So even if one agent doesn't yet say everything he knows but is interrupted by the other agent and then continues speaking after that, it doesn't matter in this sense. As long as we guarantee that everybody says everything that they know, right? So they really have to like, uh, make sure that everything they know is, is said. But there might be, uh, people might interrupt each other in this case. It doesn't really matter. Okay, when, <clears throat> when there is no non-trivial hard information, so all the knowledge um, is already common knowledge, now we're looking at uh, merging soft, the soft information. And to do that, we're looking at joint radical upgrades. So the protocol for this one is that the agents have to publicly and sincerely announce via radical upgrades everything that they strongly believe. Now, note that they don't have to say that they strongly believe something. They have to be persuasive. So they have to announce why when they strongly believe why. Right? So they don't just have to say, I strongly believe something or I believe something, because that will not be persuasive. And we will see more examples uh, later on about like, uh, the notion of persuasiveness and sincerity. But of course, in this case, the order does matter. Right? So the order of the speakers matters. We have to take into account the hierarchy of the group. So in my example, Mary was the one who had the priority, so she has to speak first. So in this sense, otherwise you, you realize a different result. Right? So, okay. As I said, being informed of somebody else's belief is not, not enough to convince you. you. They really have to say phi when they strongly believe phi. Okay, so what's the protocol for this one? So here, the order of the agents in the first setting here does matter, right? So there is a hierarchy and that has to be respected. After that, all the agents have to announce, uh, so there is like a lexicograph upgrade with P, when they strongly believe P. So for everything that they strongly believe, they have to announce it and everybody performs a lexicographic upgrade with that uh, information that they get. So that's the kind of protocol that will realize the lexicographic merge. The priority merge is, um, is just a pulling together of now the, uh, the two type of protocols that we have. So first you perform uh, the protocol in which everybody, without looking at the priority order of the hierarchy of the group, first they announce everything they know and then secondly they have to announce all their strong beliefs all the files for which they have a strong belief and that will realize the priority merge okay so let's look at the example from situation from uh, that i already had so um, so that's the model right where you have the beliefs of albert and mary and now the protocol to realize the priority merge here would be this so first there you get a bang with D or G, which is the information that, uh, that's the hard information that Albert has. So Albert speaks first. And then we look at uh, the information that we have next to merge the soft information. And then uh, Mary will have to speak, right? So all her strong beliefs in this case were D. So we do a lexicographic upgrade with D, followed by a lexicographic upgrade with not G. And that's again Albert's turn here. Okay. So that's if you, if you then perform all these actions on a given input model, then you realize a specific uh, merge that we're aiming for. Now, uh, it's important to see that the order in the um, priority merge, the ordering matters, right? So if you take a priority merge of this ordering, where you have SUW and another one, WSU, then indeed that's equal to either of the two. So as a result, we will either get the top one or we get the other one, right? And that's when we follow the protocol exactly as I've described it. Now, what happens if the agents interrupt each other when we're doing um, the priority merge in the second part of the protocol, right? Not when they're talking about their knowledge, but when they're talking about their strong beliefs. What if Albert interrupts Mary before she finished saying everything that she wanted to say? Okay, so here is, you see the example. So first, um, there is an announcement of U followed by announcement of U or W, right? And um, 
I think that's the Albert's setting here, right? So first he would say, I know that's Mary. So Mary says you, and normally she would have to say a little bit more to convey the whole order information. Now, what Albert does is he gets this information you. So what happens? All the you worlds get on top of all the other worlds for Albert, right? So then if he interrupts Mary and he would immediately say, in that case, U or W, then that's changing the order of Mary already. Right? Well, she didn't finish saying everything that she strongly believed here. So normally, according to the protocol, she was supposed to say much more. And now she was interrupted by Albert. OK. If you don't respect the order rule, then indeed the resulting order that you get is neither of the two agents. So nobody here in this case was able to convince the other one, right? So you really realize something totally different. <coughs> so here you see that it's really important for the protocol to work that if we're merging the soft information that the agents do not interrupt each other. Otherwise, the one who has the priority in the hierarchy will not be able to persuade the other one to realize uh, the specific result that they have in mind. And this illustrates the power of the agenda indeed. So the important role of the person who sets the agenda, it's like the judge who signs the priorities of the witnesses in the witness stand, or the speaker of the house who determines the order of the speakers, or as well as the issues that have to be discussed. Right? So, that's, uh, so this shows indeed that that's a very important thing. Now, I think this finishes my part, and Alexander will continue with uh, pragmatics and okay. Okay. thanks yeah so this is the beginning of lecture five uh, as, as we promised um, I, I will cover two topics in, uh, in this part uh, one um, has to do with pragmatics of communication. So issues that arose already in, in Sonia's uh, talk, not, not related anymore to merging information or uh, beliefs, but just to the ideas of, uh, I mean, the, the notions that he, she used essentially informally, like sincerity, uh, honesty, persuasiveness, and so on. Uh, we want to define them in general and have a kind of, you know, capture these concepts. And uh, uh, as you see, for instance, the fact that um, in the second protocol, uh, agents, um, uh, the Sonia presented, agents announced what they strongly believed rather than what they simply believed, uh, may have come as a surprise to you, and it wasn't really explained why, it just you know, it works, but now uh, it will be part of, of the explanation. So here you'll see, I hope, by the end of this, that why, uh, why strongly be, strong beliefs. So that's the first part of my talk, and the second part um, I will uh, um, uh, talk a little bit about rational agency and rationality in games. So there's the movie. I don't know if you see very well in this light, but that's uh, Jack Sparrow. And these are the two British officers uh, that stop him uh, when he arrives in Port Royal on a sinking boat. And then the following dialogue happens. Mauroy, the first uh, British uh, officer, says, um, what's your purpose in Port Royal, Mr. Smith? It's because Jack Sparrow calls himself Smith. The other officer says, yeah, and no lies. Jack Sparrow, well then, I confess, it is my intention to commandeer one of these ships, pick up a crew on Tortuga, raid, pillage, plunder, and otherwise pit for my Weasley black guts out. Martin, I said no lies. Mauroy, I think he's telling the truth. Um, Martin, don't be stupid. If you are telling the truth, he wouldn't have told it to us. Jack Sparrow. Unless, of course, he knew you wouldn't believe the truth, even if he told it to you. So, um, we need to analyze this logically and um, decide, um, was, was Jack Sparrow lying? Can we say that he was lying? Was he sincere? Uh, and if he wasn't lying, if he was telling the truth, or what he believed to be the truth, what's wrong with his statement? Is there anything wrong? Was he honest uh, or was he cheating? Can one lie by telling the truth? Can one cheat by being sincere? Here is a dual example. Brad Pitt, that's the guy here. Uh, his thoughts on lying about how much money you make on your online dating profile. This is from an interview to Wired magazine. 
Everyone lies online. In fact, we don't expect you to lie. If you don't, they'll, they'll think you make even less than you actually do. So the only way to tell the truth about how much money you have is to lie, to exaggerate about it. So this seems, seems like um, an, an advocacy for honest lies. Right? Well, the, uh, the, the Jack Sparrow example was something more like sincere cheating, because Jack Sparrow told the truth um, while in the fam in, in the same time he said cheating. And there are other examples from um, from history. We know now that Saddam Hussein has acquired weapons of mass destruction. This is from George W. Bush, 2002. Was he lying? Well, he couldn't have possibly known what he claimed, because knowledge implies truth, and we know now that there are no such things as weapons of mass destruction in, in Iran. But was he sincere, at least? And if he was, what does this mean? He believed that he knew, right? That he believed that he knew what he claimed. Assuming that he was sincere, was he honest? Or was he cheating on his audience? And in what sense he was? What we do now, speaking of sincerity, sincerity, honesty, and persuasiveness, is that he was persuasive. Most of the American people came to believe his claim at that time. But let's cut the crap. How about Bart Simpson? This is the picture. Bart has, uh, uh, fancies a girl, or in his own word, digs this chick, uh, Jessica, who unfortunately doesn't dig him at all in return. So finally Bart catches her on the phone, and uh, he has to say something. And how sincere and honest will he be, or can he be? And if he's honest, will it work? Will it be uh, persuasive, the, the kind of sincere, honest Bart crap? Uh, so um, that's what he says. Uh, in one of the interpretations. He doesn't literally say that. You'll see what he says, but okay. I know I'm the man of your dreams. Okay? Um, to formalize doxastic attitudes that we introduced uh, earlier, uh, logically you would need um, um, two components. One is the dynamic modalities that we used, except that now uh, in the modality we specify uh, the speaker. So modality i colon phi means speaker i says phi. We don't, we don't specify anymore in this setting uh, the, um, uh, the attitude, like the bang or upgrade or update, uh, because we, we capture in the modality just the, the speech act by itself. And we leave the attitude in the background as kind of um, pre-existing pre -existing on the side of the listener. So divide the, two, the actions that we had in two now the actions of speaking and the action, well, of receiving and interpreting the information according to your priorly existing attitude. And the way you encode attitudes is by atomic sentences that will have a, they will play a specific role, so they will not be ontic, ontic facts like the other atomic things. Tau ji, where tau can be bang, radical upgrade, conservative update, identity, neutral, neutrality, any attitude, right? And j and i are agents, or distinct agents. And what this sentence says is that J has the attitude tau towards agent I. So whenever agent I will say something, J will apply that kind of upgrade, tau, to the, to the same. And he will interpret in that way. And uh, yeah, I will, I, will go, I will go fast about the semantics, not uh, do all the details. But essentially, uh, so you're given in the semantics, uh, in addition to valuation maps for the ordinary atomic sentences, uh, you're, uh, you're given um, uh, evaluations for the new ones, but you also associate with each of these a, a single legend of sassy transformation, an upgrade in the sense that we defined before, a model transformer. So uh, also denoted by tau. Well, here the, the, the two are essentially, I mean, the symbols already tell you what the transformer is, right? And there will be some semantic constraints. Uh, Again, I don't want to insist on the, on the details. You want, for instance, that every agent has some unique attitude towards every other agent. OK, you might doubt that. The agents might be undecided. But in order to make this precise, uh, it would be harder. Also, you might want to do kind of introspection about their own attitudes. So the agent knows hard, hard information about his own attitude to the other agents. In other words, throughout his information cell, Mr. J has the same attitude to Mr. I. Um, Another simplifying assumption that, that we will uh, use only in this talk, you don't want to make it in general, is that the toxicity attitudes towards each other are common knowledge. That allows you to draw nicely 
uh, the themes. So you will have a, a mutual trust graph, um, one for the whole model. If you drop the common knowledge assumption of, of each other's attitude, then you'll have a mutual trust graph at each world, a different graph. So an example of such graph is this one. Right? So you have uh, the nodes are, this is not a Kripke model, right? So it's just a representation of the trust, mutual trust. So the nodes are agents, one to three. And the, uh, the arrows, the, yeah, the, the arrows are labeled with uh, doxastic attitudes, upgrades or updates. And the meaning is here. If I have an arc um, uh, labeled from tau, from node j to node i, this says that tau j i holds it a model at that world. So that uh, agent j has that particular attitude towards agent i. So in other words, for instance here, uh, agent 2 trusts agent 1 infallibly so. So considers uh, one infallible. And by the way, by the definition of infallibility, if, 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 if somebody trusts you infallible, then you are infallible. Because that's what it, I mean, you just by definition tell the truth. While, for instance, agent one barely trusts the agent two because he applies a conservative argument. And you might want further constraints here uh, to make it um, uh, kind of more rational. For instance, if somebody trusts infallibly somebody else, and this is common knowledge, as we assume, uh, say, for instance, agent 3 knows that agent 2 considers agent 1 infallible, then it's natural for agent 3 to consider 1 infallible as well, because essentially he knows that somebody else knows that this guy always tells the truth. But okay, um, so, and the semantics of a communication act in this, in this so a communication act will be a, 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 an action denoted by i colon phi, so i says phi, right, for which we have dynamic modalities. And all I have to tell you is what is the underlying transform model transformation to this action. And then you'll know how to interpret the dynamic modality as usual. So the transformation is the following. Uh, we take a model, a multi-user model. And uh, the new model for after the action i says phi uh, is, is given in the following way. For any of the listeners, the listeners are all the j's different from i, from the speaker. We look at, at their information cells. And within each of the information cells, uh, we apply the transformer tau. Which tau? Well, in that information cell, by introspection, it's a j information cell, there is one atomic sentence of the form tau ji that holds all over the place in that by introspection. And that's the tau that you apply, which represents agent j's attitude at that world or in that cell towards the agent uh, i. So you apply that particular tau. Uh, with a sentence phi that was announced to the pre-order of the agent j inside the cell. So, so for instance, if tau is bang, you do locally inside the cell uh, uh, update with phi. If it's conservative upgrade, you do a conservative, and so on. Uh, and this is for each of the listeners. What do you do with the speaker's pre-order? You keep it the same, because the speaker is the speaker. He doesn't change his mind just because he said something. Right? He may learn something, because um, all this is simultaneous, so uh, he, I mean, it's public announcement, so he learns that the others learn. He learns that the others change their, their, their plausibility. But there is nothing to do with his own plausibility. He keeps the same plausibility. And the rest is, is, uh, is trivial. Uh, variation is essentially the same, as usual, um, and so on. And the semantics of the learning modality is what you expect. Yeah? You just move to a new model, and you evaluate the sentence after that. So we say the communication act I says phi is sincere if the speaker believes her own announcement before making it, right, in the old mode. So B I phi holds. Uh, and sometimes you may want to assume common knowledge in sincerity. That was what happened in Sonia's setting. When you do this nice merge, there was an underlying assumption that common knowledge of sincerity. It was just a sincerity. It was that everybody kind of uh, accepted it. Um, now, uh, notice that sincerity does not imply truthfulness. That's trivial, right? I really am the man of your dreams is a typical sincere lie. I mean, typically it's false, but uh, the agent believes it. Bart believes it, at least. Um, on the other hand, when applied to introspective properties, sincerity does imply truthfulness. I believe I am the man of your dreams. If it's sincere, then it's true, because, because the agent is introspective. He knows what he believes and what not, and if he claims that it's sincere, then it must be true. All right, uh, next point, fixed points. Uh, so it's important, I mean, the fixed point of the oxidative attitudes of this as, as thought of as model transformations are important 
and I will, I will explain, I'll try to, to justify why. But let's just have a notation now. So uh, given a uh, doxastic attitude, uh, it's an R there, I'm not sure it's visible, uh, it's the name of an agent, and you have a doxastic attitude tau, in the sense that we mentioned, it's a dynamic attitude, it's a model transformer, uh, I denote by tau bar i phi the uh, static attitude given by the fixed point of, of this transformation. So in other words, this holds, that's the, that's the form of semantics, this kind of tau bar i holds of phi at the state, if and only if you, if you take uh, the transformation tau with the sentence phi, and you apply it to the, uh, only to the, the i part of the model, to the i's relation, you get, some, you get essentially the same as before. Okay, so it's a, it, we are in a fixed point. So what does this mean? Uh, why, why these kind of attitudes are important? Oh, first I give you examples. So if you take update, uh, the bar thing, the fixed point is knowledge. Uh, right, so, um, and for negative update is knowledge of the falsehood of the thing. For a radical upgrade, uh, well, it's strongly be strong belief. Uh, in fact, there is something, uh, something, uh, something of a cheating here, because there are two kinds of fixed points for this. Uh, think of it, a radical upgrade, uh, as you saw in the surprise examination, uh, can uh, can. Um, can keep the model the same in two cases. Either if what's said is already strongly believed, right? because what a radical upgrade do, does makes all the phi more plausible than all the not phi's. So if the agent already strongly believes phi, which means all the phi's are already on top of the not phi's, then there is nothing to be done. Right? But the other case, of course, the negative, what I would call a negative fixed point, is the one in which um, phi is impossible. Phi is known to be false. So there, there are no phi worlds. Hence, moving them on top doesn't change anything because you're okay. so. Uh, but now we're talking about assuming that phi is not known to be <laughs> right to be false. Uh, in that case, having being in a fixed point is essentially the same as having strong belief of phi. Um, for uh, for conservative average, the corresponding criterion of the f uh, fixed point is belief, because what does that does is moving the most plausible phi worlds, making them the most plausible over, so you achieve belief in phi, but if you already have belief in phi to start with, so, uh, right, then, I mean, this means the most plausible worlds are phi worlds, so there is nothing to be done. Um, and the fixed point of identity is, is tautologies. Now, first explanation of the importance of these fixed points, which you might have guessed already from the, from the examples, is that they capture the attitudes that are induced uh, in the listener, so to speak, in the agent that receives information phi, uh, when he receives it from a source, a speaker, the words she has the attitude tau. Right? So, right? so you have, say, so Mr. J has the attitude tau to Mr. I. And then I says P. Uh, what does this induce? Uh, induce a, uh, uh, say belief or knowledge or strong belief of P itself in the listener. What exactly is induced depends on the tau. And uh, it, it actually is the fixed point, the positive fixed point of that tau. That's what it induces. So after an example, after update, uh, so what, after getting pa P or from a, from a uh, person towards I have an update as you, I consider it infallible, what I get is knowledge of P. I come to know P. For, for more sentences, for phi's in general is more complicated, I come to know that phi was the case, remember? So I need a before operator. But for P, it's, it's just like that. Uh, if my attitude was radical upgrade, so I strongly trust the source, then after the source tells me P, I acquire strong belief in P. Because I put all my P's on top of not P. So now I have the strong belief in P. And so on. So that's what, what's important about these fixed points. They capture exactly um, the attitude that is induced by this speech act, right? Or by this communication when uh, the attitude of the uh, listener towards the speaker was tough. There is a dual aspect, though, on the other hand. Uh, and that's connected to, to um, in a way, to honesty. Uh, so think of it as redundancy. If you are in a fixed point, 
uh, of a transformation, then doing the transformation is, is redundant. Doesn't change anything. So it's uninformative. Right? So if I already know P, uh, having an update with P will not do anything. Uh, that's the definition of a fixed point. If I only strongly believe P, then a radical upgrade uh, with P will not do anything. Uh, so uh, in this sense, uh, having a fixed point attitude of this, of this tau bar uh, kind uh, captures the fact that um, uh, announcing the thing is redundant. And the fact that I just noticed that um, an announcement with corresponding fixed point in the listener essentially says, essentially, what I just said, says that the repeating of course there are tricks here because more sentences as you know, or sentences that are doxastic, repeating them is not redundant. But uh, let's think of uh, atomic sentences. For them it will be redundant. And for the others in a sense it will be, but only in a different sense. So, uh, yeah, if you announce that the same atomic sentence twice, is the same as once. And this is for any of the attitudes that we, we talked. You don't have to know that in order to um, to get it. Now, what happens uh, with a speaker? So, Sonia mentioned the honesty of the speaker, but didn't really define it. What we would like is the speaker himself to have the same attitude towards what he says as the one that he induces in the listener. Right? So I induce, I want him to know, believe something, then I better believe it myself. Uh, okay, belief is the fixed point for uh, conservative average. So if I announce it and I know that he has a conservative ability to me, so and I say five, then I better be. Because otherwise I'm dishonest. I'm inducing something else than what I am. <coughs> but for instance, if I know that he strongly believes me, then the standard is higher for me. Because if the guy strongly believes me, then he will do a radical upgrade what I'm saying. So if I say five, he will acquire, or P, he will acquire strong belief in P. He will put all the P's on top or not. I better have this myself. If I don't, for instance, if I, before the speech act, I only barely believed the P, but I didn't strongly believe it, then I induce in the listener a stronger attitude than I had myself. And I'm not honest. Right? So this is a kind of dishonesty to do that. Right? Uh, so uh, that's the definition of honesty. Uh, and it's a relation, well, it's a sentence, but uh, that takes two agents and a sentence. So agent I is honest in the, when he says phi, is honest with respect to listener J, if uh, I, the speaker, has the same attitude towards phi as the one he induces, or in general he believes to induce when you don't have common knowledge of it, in the listener. And this can be defined using our, well, assuming we have in our model is finite, so we have finitely many uh, the doxastic attitudes uh, actually occurring there. This honesty can be defined using our fixed point kind of attitude operator uh, as a big conjunction. That essentially, if you believe that the, the listener has that attitude, uh, then you're, you're honest when you say phi to him, if and only if you're in the fixed point of that thing already. So in other words, that yeah, if you'd be the listener and you'd have this being announced to you, uh, then you wouldn't change anything. This would be redundant for you, so you're honest. And of course, it's harder to, to be honest to everybody. That's a fact of life. Uh, what could possibly be honesty to everybody? Well, if you are honest with respect to all the agents, all the reasons. Sometimes it's impossible because, um, because uh, think of it, uh, if somebody trusts me and somebody strongly distrusts me, and somebody always does an upgrade uh, with what <coughs> I'm saying, and somebody does an upgrade with the negation of what I'm saying, then I can't possibly be honest to both. Right? Because <laughs> I either believe it or I don't. Uh, so, um, sometimes it's not easy to be honest. Uh, but okay, let's see examples. So, when a speaker I is deemed infallible by one or more of the agents, then he's honest when he says phi, if he knows what he says. He already knows phi. Right? Uh, when the attitude uh, uh, of the listeners is uh, barely trust, so the, the conservative average, then the speaker is honest if he believes what he says. Finally, when the attitude of the listeners is radical upgrade, so strong trust, then the speaker uh, is honest if he strongly believes what he says. And that's obvious, right? It's because that's the fixed point. Now you understand uh, why in Sonia's setting for merge, 
uh, when um, the agents had to uh, announce by a radical upgrade uh, some of their beliefs, they better strongly believe them. So they were announcing only the things that they strongly believe. And this was to do with honesty. Right? So they couldn't just announce things that they barely believe if, they do, if, if the listeners do radical upgrade, because that would be cheap. It would be inducing in them a stronger belief that, they, that, the, that the speaker has. Right? While for updates, for the first part of the protocol, the hard information, they had to better to know it. Remember, the condition was they know. They update, they announce by an update everything they know, and they announce by a radical update everything they strongly believe. And that was the way to merge both the hard information, the equivalence relations, and, and the soft information, which was the plausibility relations. Ah, if they wanted to merge just their beliefs, their plain beliefs, uh, for this, they could have done just, uh, just a conservative. So they could have used conservative upgrades with what they just barely believe. Okay? But we didn't, the protocol didn't go into that. So now we can look at our examples. So uh, agent I, called Jack Sparrow, strongly believes P. And in fact, he knows P. P is that he was going to rape and pillage and uh, commandeer a ship, etc. Uh, and P is actually true. He will do that. Uh, then he also knows that he's strongly distrusted by his, by his audience, J, say the British soldiers. Uh, they, will all, they will do an upgrade, a negative upgrade. Right? This is affecting his statement. He knows that you won't believe him, even if he's telling you the truth. So then in this case, announcing P, which is the plunder, by Jack Sparrow I, is actually sincere and truthful, because, yeah, uh, he means it, and it's true, but it's dishonest. It's dishonest in the sense that we define, because he's in, it, he knows very well that he induces in the listener a different attitude that he has towards the, uh, the sentence that he's announcing. He actually believes what he says, but he knows that he induces disbelief in what he says in the, in the others. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a dishonest, truthful sincerity. The duel is Brad Pitt, um, a strongly trust, distrusted speaker. Like, like the, in both cases, the, the speaker is strongly distrusted. He knows that the others are strongly distrusted. OK, how can he be honest? How can he avoid the Jack Sparrow thing? Well, by telling lies. So, uh, and that's what Brad Pitt claims uh, to have done in his um, online um, ad. Um, Right, so he, uh, he announces the opposite or an exaggeration of what he honestly believes and knows because he knows that the listener will, up, they will actually upgrade with something different than what he believes, you know. Uh, so the only way to tell the truth in this case is to lie. So that's an example of an honest lie. He announces not P while believing P and while knowing that he induces the same belief in P as he has in the, in the listener. Now, um, so uh, that if, you, if, you have, if a speaker is strongly distrusted, strongly distrusted means radical upgrade always with what is the neg negation of what he says, then essentially everything is reverted from before. So instead of, the, in order to be honest, instead of have to strongly believe what he says, he has to strongly disbelieve it, strongly believe the opposite. Right? So this shows that honesty does not imply sincerity either. Now, uh, in the Bush example, uh, we have a dual case because the speaker was strongly trusted. The American people, or the majority of them, strongly trust the speaker. Uh, so um, they strongly believe whatever he says. Uh, the, w let's assume the speaker was actually sincere. We give him the benefit of that. Which means he believed, he barely believed, uh, that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iran. There were some reports from Africa, from some arms dealers selling some stuff that they did something, but they were kind of very flimsy. So he believed it, but he didn't have strong evidence for it. Um, so, right? He has no strong evidence, but only hearsay evidence. He barely be believes this evidence. So he could say uh, phi, and he would be sincere. Uh, but he might get other problems, because he's not sure that this is the truth. Uh, he cannot um, also, if you would say phi, what would happen is that he knows he will induce strong belief in phi into the audience. 
Now, inducing strong belief in these cells is cheating, is dishonest. Right? So if Bush says, I, uh, th there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, <coughs> while just barely believing it, uh, and knowing that he strongly trusted, then this is a dishonest act in this formal sense. All right, how can Bush avoid this problem? He can say, we believe there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. That, that will be sincere, certainly, because he believes it, and truthful, in fact. Uh, and it will be honest. Uh, you can check that it's honest. Uh, in order to be honest, he has to strongly believe what he's saying, that namely strongly believe that he believes <laughs> phi. And uh, by, if you look at the plausibility models, you see the strongly believing that you believe is the same as just believing. So, so he does. Uh, OK, so it's honest. But it's not intuitive, at least, it's not persuasive. And that's the third uh, aspect in, in uh, Sonia's um, talk, persuasiveness. In what sense is not persuasive? Well, even if the American people strongly believe what he says, all they get from this sentence is that Bush believes it. That Bush believes there are weapons of <coughs> mass destruction. That's not the same as them believing that there are weapons of mass destruction. So that's not persuading them of what he needs to persuade them. Uh, OK, we'll, we'll see what persuasion can possibly mean in this context, how to define it. But now, uh, leaving this issue aside, aside, let's see. There are other things, stronger things, that Bush can say in this situation. And honestly, he can claim honestly other things, more than that. And the answer is yes. He can claim much more and still be honest. Namely, he can claim that he knows that there are weapons of mass destruction. Right? As long as we interpret knowledge in the, in the defeasible sense, which is the day-to-day -day kind of closer to the day-to-day -day usage of knowledge, not absolutely certain, but right. So if he says, "We know that there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq," and "No is the box," then uh, then this act will be honest. Uh, and let's see, did I explain? Yes. So it will be sincere because he believes it. Why? Because we saw the equivalence, I believe that I know in this sense, is the same as I believe it. So it's enough for him to believe that a weapon is advanced destruction, right? and then he will automatically believe that he knows in that sense. But moreover, he also strongly believes. Uh, because you can easily see that strong belief by an agent applied to his own uh, yeah, uh, knowledge, defeasible knowledge, is the same as believing. Right? So if you believe it, then you strongly believe that you know it in this sense. And he's, yeah, so as long as he believes the sentence itself, or the opposite of the then he strongly believes this sentence. Hence, he can announce it and be honest in the sense that we, do, we, yeah, we, we uh, said. Uh, the others strongly trust him. They acquire strong belief in this. But he has strong belief in this, so he's honest. Everything is done. Uh, another example is, is Bart. Bart can say, I believe I'm the man of your dreams. And, but this will not be, and this will be honest and sincere, but it will not be persuasive. Because right, if he says that, I believe I am the man of your dreams, Jessica's answer naturally would be, it's OK, Bart. I believe that you believe it. But I still don't buy it myself. So that's all right. What he is, if he says, I really am the man of your dreams, then he risks being dishonest, because it's more than what he has. So. In order to be persuasive, he will have to say, I know I am the man of your dreams. Uh, and if we take this as, as knowledge in the sense of the defeasible knowledge, then this is sincere, it's uh, honest, and it's persuasive if she strongly trusts Bart, which is a big if. Okay. All right, so formally, the definition of persuasiveness, uh, it will be a relation involving two agents and two sentences. So agent I, when announcing phi, is persuasive to the listener J with respect to a, a given issue, theta, because the issue that he wants to convince is not the same as what he says. You say something, and your intention is to convince him of something else, maybe, or the same. If the effect of the announcement is that the, of phi by I is that the listener J is converted to the same attitude towards theta as the speaker. So the speaker say believed, or strongly believed, or knew theta. And he wants to convert the, the listener to that attitude, believe, know, whatever, theta. And uh, if he says phi, right? uh, and if he says phi, 
and he obtains this, this effect that, uh, that he converts, then um, he's persuasive with respect to this. And this can be defined in the logic, but I'm not. Uh, so the general question, which we kind of answered in a special case by that, uh, is the following. I have a strongly trusted agent I, like Mr. Bush. He wants to be honest and sincere and truthful, but he also wants to be persuasive with respect to some issue, theta, that he barely believes. It. <laughs> right? But he wants the others to also come to believe it. Uh, so strongly trusted means they all have radical average or see, barely believes means it's just be item. But not necessarily strongly believe. What she should say? And we saw that he cannot say, he shouldn't say theta itself, because this might be dishonest. He cannot say, I know theta in the sense of k, because this will typically be dishonest. He cannot say, I believe theta, because this will be honest but not persuasive. Because being informed and others believe is not enough to convince you of their truth. So what he can say is, I know theta in this sense, or the feasible sense, which is the typical. So that would be maybe in a sense an exaggeration, because he's not sure he knows it. He believes he knows it. He strongly believes it. Uh, but uh, it's an honest one, right? So because everything is you know, sincere, truthful, and honest, and does the job. It like converts the others to the same belief in theta that he actually has. So the lesson is that if you want to convert people to your beliefs, don't be too scrupulous with the truth. Announce that you know things, even if you don't know for sure that you know them. Um, as long as you believed it yourself, everybody will say you are honest. Simple belief, a loud voice, and strong guts is all you need to be persuasive. And also you need, need people to strongly trust you. Okay. Um, so this was on the topic of uh, all I have to say today on, the, on this topic. Uh, that there is more. Uh, if you come to Rain, I hope uh, Ben, um, one of uh, a PhD student of uh, Sonia, uh, has a paper there on the subject of those studies that he's studying them mathematically more, uh, more in depth. Now, in the remaining time, I want to discuss, and I'll try to be uh, to, to compress a bit, uh, uh, applications or other relations to game theory. Uh, and one typical um, uh, typical uh, case in game theory in which belief revision was applied, uh, uh, leading to well debatable results, uh, is um, games of perfect information, which would say you you think are the easiest. So a game of perfect information is is in one in which everybody sees what's going on. Uh, so every every action, every move is public. Uh, there is no uncertainty about the past actions. So like chess, right? So you do something and everybody sees. It. Nothing is hidden, as in, as, in, uh, as in poker, for instance. Except, of course, the future. Nobody knows what will happen, but all the past is known. And uh, the standard, uh, the standard uh, solution concept for, uh, for such games in game theory is uh, backwards induction solution. Um, and now, this is a famous quote of uh, Halpern. Uh, there is a debate between Aumann, a game Nobel Prize game theorist, who essentially proved in his first paper on this topic that common knowledge of rationality implies the backwards induction solution in games of perfect information. And uh, after this, Halpern says, Stalnaker, a philosopher, has proved that he does not, uh, which sounds like a paradox. So this is the example. This is a, uh, a so-called centipede game. You can make uh, games like this of any length, very, very long. The longer, the more unintuitive the, the game theoretic uh, solution is. But OK, let's stop with this one. Uh, so there are two players. There is some ball. This is not a cricket model. It's a game. Right? So the arrows are moves. Uh, uh, the, the, the nodes are called v0, v1, v2. The outcomes are uh, when the game stops are 0, 01, or 2, or 3, or 4. Uh, the names of the player who plays at that node is A, B, A, B. They play uh, interleavingly, uh, alternatively. And the payoffs are given as, as numbers, pairs of numbers. The first represents the pairs of Alice, the second the pair of Bob. So this is the game. Yeah? Now one can essentially say that the, 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 the backwards induction solution says we proceed backwards from the outcomes. And we eliminate, uh, we go one step before, and we eliminate the move that goes to an outcome that ensures smaller payoff to the person who does the move, right? because that's irrational. So for instance, uh, here, between 0, 3, or 4, 
the, the chooser is Alice, she chooses, and she gets five here and four there. So she should be, should be, would be stupid for her to play to all four. So she should go down, right? To go down to all three. Okay, given this, we can eliminate all four altogether because we know she's not going to do it, so the game looks like that. Now, we are at the V1, uh, B is to play, and he has to choose either to go down, and he will get an amount of three, or to go across, where given what we just proved, Alice will go down, and he, Bob, will get an amount of two dollars. So if he's smart, he will go to O2 to get three. Right? And we repeat the reasoning. Now Alice has to choose at V0, and she sees that in this case she gets three, there she gets two, so she better go down to O1. So the, the, the game stops with the first move. There is no further game. Okay? Alice just goes down, gets uh, $3, Bob gets nothing. Of course, by the way, uh, people who don't know game theory might, might also say, well, but isn't this stupid? So we prescribe as a matter of rationality for them to play this. Uh, where, if you think about it, uh, if they play across all the way to V2, then no matter what to do, what they do, both of them will be better off than, than 3-0. They'll get either 5-2 or 4-5, which is better than 3-0 for both of them. So, huh? So Alman's argument says, look, suppose it's common knowledge that everybody's rational, which means everybody chooses, whenever he has a choice, uh, does not choose the, the, the move that he or she believes will lead to a worse outcome, for, a worse money, money payoff for himself. Then, then we can argue first the first elimination. Alice is rational, she will not go, yeah, so between 04 and 03, she will choose 03. All right? But since rationality is common knowledge, all this reasoning can be, it's common knowledge. So Bob knows she's rational, so she, he knows that she will not choose 04, but rather 03. So he can uh, simulate her move in his, her elimination in his mind already. So uh, Bob knows that she will choose a three, and now given this knowledge, it becomes irrational for him to uh, uh, to choose to go across, right? Given this knowledge, so he will uh, go go to a two, and so on. You can re reproduce this using the in, at each step, a each elimination step. You're using not only what you prove, but also common knowledge of what you prove, because of common knowledge of rationality. So that's Alban's argument essentially. Now, what's Stalnaker's counter argument? So Steiner claims that common knowledge and rationality in some sense is not enough and will not ensure backward deduction at all. So one way to present is the following. Suppose we buy the theorem. So common knowledge of, back, of, of rationality implies backward deduction. Good. Now uh, we restart analyzing the game. So Bo knows, based on the theorem, he can prove the theorem, his rational, that if rationality is common knowledge, then Alice should actually move down here, right? By the backward induction solution. Suppose he finds himself at node V1, right? What will he think? Well, this contradicts the theorem, right? If Alice actually moved in a counterfactual to V1, this means she didn't move down, as the theorem says she should. So this means the hypothesis, the, the assumption that, it's com that we have common knowledge of rationality didn't hold. Right? So in that case, he will have to conclude that something went around with the common knowledge of rationality. Either Alice is irrational, or uh, even if she's rational, still they don't have common knowledge. Maybe she believes that he's irrational, or maybe she believes that he believes that she's irrational. Something happened that broke common knowledge of rationality. Otherwise, she shouldn't have gone there by the theorem. Given this, if he ever sees himself as the one, he has to choose whether to go across or not. And he cannot use the assumption of common knowledge of rationality from then forward at all. Hence, he cannot say, ah, I just proved by the same theorem that uh, at the next step, if I move across, Alice will go down because of the theorem. Because that theorem assumes common knowledge of rationality. But common knowledge of rationality was already disproved. By the time you got to V1, there is no more common knowledge of rationality. Hence, there is no reason for, for Bob to assume that, that Alice will go down. 
she might as well go across further. Maybe she's stupid. If she goes across, then it becomes rational for him to go, to go across as well. Because, uh, because he'll, gain, he'll gain five rather than three. So all bets are off. The moment you imagine counterfactual that you are at v, non V1, there is no reason, I mean, nothing in the assumption of homology of rationality can help you. Because that's already off. That's essentially the argument. Now, the claim is uh, that to analyze this, all, all, everything depends on the belief revision policies of the agents. So uh, we, we looked at belief revision policies abstra abstractly till now. But we want to look at them in the context of a game. So given uh, belief revision is what's triggered by a surprise. You believe something, and then something uh, different happens. In this case, Bob believed that they have common knowledge of rationality. Hence, he believed that Alice should go down. But what will he believe if she disproves this, if she surprises him by going across? What will he be his next belief? And that is the question. This is a, a belief revision question. And it depends, of course, on Bob's belief revision policy. How, how, what is his disposition to change his beliefs? How exactly does he do it when he encounters unexpected information? So what will Bob believe about Alice if he'd seen her irrationally choosing V1 over O1, like going across other than now? So one possible policy is to be pessimistic about rationality. Like one strike and you're out. If you see somebody doing something that appears to be irrational, then they are irrational. And then, you, moreover, you believe they'll, they'll be irrational from now, because they've been it once. So, and so this is the pessimistic, the extremely pessimistic. Uh, it might be naive, uh, but it, it is a possible policy. It's irrational to, to, to do that. Right? So in other words, once he sees her Alice going across, he, uh, he doesn't believe she's rational anymore. Actually, she believes, he believes she is irrational from now on, that she will choose wrong all the time. What will happen in that case? Well, uh, what will happen is that he, he will start to believe that at V2, Alice will go across rather than down, despite the obvious stupidity of such a move. Given this, reason, given this belief, becomes, as I said, rational for him to go across as well, believing that she will go across as well. And you see, in, both, in this case, they are both rational. So I'm not saying that Alice will do that. I'm saying that be, Bob believes now, after the first apparently stupid move of Alice, he believes that, uh, by pessimistic policy, that she will do this. Right? And becomes rational for him to do this as well. And he does it, let's say. In other words, Bob is rational, and he arrives here. But now, in fact, let's assume that Alice is rational to start with. So, since she is rational, she will not go across. She will go down. And this will be the outcome of the game. So this outcome is consistent with having essentially, in a sense, well, rational, they are both rational. And in a sense, they had common knowledge or common belief, true belief in rationality here. While in, in addition to that, Bob has this pessimistic revision policy. And this justifies this outcome, rather than the backwards induction outcome. They both are rational. Um, and they get 5-2, which is actually, anyway, better than what the classical backwards induction solution tells you. But it appears that we proved both P and not P, right? So assuming common knowledge of rationality, we proved both that they should play backwards induction solution and they shouldn't. So that's why people in game theory, uh, well, uh, Christina Bicchieri and uh, Bean Moore and others called the backwards induction paradox. Now, um, there are several things that one could do here in this context. One could do, and uh, we did this, uh, just formalize this, this reason. So essentially formalize the different kinds of belief revision policies. Uh, pessimi this extreme pessimism is one kind. It's not the only one, of course. An alternative would be to be wildly optimistic. So in other words, at any given moment, no matter what the past is, uh, still hope for rationality. Uh, believe that the agents from now on will be rational. Uh, you can't at some point uh, keep believing in what's called in game theory substantive rationality, which means rationality at all nodes, in the past, in the future, and the future. Because if, if the agent does something clearly stupid, then you cannot possibly believe that she was rational. But what you can always consistently believe is that she will be rational from now on, that she will choose uh, best from now. Right? Because the past does not determine uniquely the future. So 
it's, it is consistent, it is rational, to, it, uh, possible rational choice, to be naively optimistic about, about, um, about rationality. And you can formalize this notion, I'm not going to details, and essentially this will give you a justification for backward induction. You can, you can see that if you have common knowledge of naive optimism in this sense, so if I'm naive optimist uh, and Bob is naive optimist, so we both know that we are, then essentially the agents will play the backward induction without uh, having common knowledge of rationality itself, just having this kind of weaker, weaker thing since called common knowledge of optimism. Another, another subtle aspect has to do with the, with the notion of knowledge itself. You saw that in this course there are more than one notions of knowledge. Alma's notion is the notion of the K notion, the S5 absolute certain notion. And that's, that's the one that in a sense poses problems from this, from, from, from this point of view. <coughs> because essentially, Alma's answer to Stalnacker was, no matter what counterfactual you do, no matter what you imagine, at V1, you know, another possible world, common knowledge of rationality means the agents know that, the other, that they are rational, they both are rational. And they know in this irrevocable sense that you cannot possibly revise. So no matter what they see, they shouldn't give it up. Uh, hence, they should use the common knowledge of rationality. They, they, are, they are able to use it again and again as an assumption further. Stalnacker answers, yeah, but this is absurd. Because, because uh, this will be inconsistent with what they see. Uh, and Alma answers, yeah, but this is the nature of knowledge. Knowledge is a fixed thing. So, and um, on top of this, many dangerous or cognitive scientists says, uh, say, well, even if the theorem is true, which kind of mathematically, of course, it is, it's not useful because we never have common knowledge of rationality in that sense, in the sense of our Think about what it means. The knowledge that we're talking about, the K, is absolutely certain, infallible knowledge. Uh, it also distributes over implication, like any normal modality. So common knowledge of rationality implies, by our theorem, common knowledge of the backward induction solution. In other words, they have common knowledge that, that this is what will happen. Right? Common, absolutely unrevisable knowledge that, that, that the future is determined, that this is what will happen and nothing else. That is it. Bye bye. No game to be played. And in any application of Alman's theorem, essentially that's what happens. Like essentially the whole future will be determined if you assume common knowledge of rationality. There is no game whatsoever. Which strikes most people as kind of a uh, very strong assumption that is never the case. What we would like is to reduce, uh, weaken the notion of knowledge in such a way that it becomes something realistic to have some kind of knowledge of rationality. Uh, and maybe to also obtain the backward deduction solution, at least given some other assumptions, as a possible way to play, but without having such strong assumptions as, as always. So a regional candidate to look is the defeasible or indefeasible knowledge box, our box. Right? And um, that's not it, by the way. We thought in the beginning that it is it, but you will see immediately why it's not. So uh, we want to look at it in terms of robustness. right? Uh, this notion of knowledge, as you remember, is robust, but not as robust as K. So it's resistant to belief revision, but only belief revision with true information, rather than belief revision with everything. Right? So, and this was the equivalence, right? Box A, Q holds, if and only if um, Q is believed by the agent given any P, as long as P is true in the real world. Now, the problem here is that these Q's and P's are what? Are um, sets of states, or if you like, atomic sentences, Boolean formula. Uh, if, you, if you have formulas, sentences, instead of Q, that refer to, to the agent's knowledge or belief themselves, then we have the more problem, right? And uh, then the correct, uh, the correct uh, thing is rather, rather this, that um, after you update with P, no matter new inf what new information the agent gets, update means truthful by definition. Uh, he doesn't believe the phi itself, but believes that phi was the case. Uh, I mean, and phi was the case. So it's truth, true belief. Right? So that's another way to look at the box. Box is the kind of ensures true belief, true stable belief after any, any new true information is received, but true in the sense of the past and stable belief in about the past. Not about what is actually the case after the announcement or what is actually believed up to be the case after the announcement. Right? So that's the correct statement. It's equivalent to that from, from up. Right? 
but it's the one in terms of updates, in terms of what the actual dynamics that are then conditional beliefs. And this is what you do in a game. After, in a game of pattern information, after you see a move, you have to update with that, the fact that that move happened. It's a thing beyond any doubt that it happened. Right? So it's, it's perfect information games. Right? So you see what's going on, you update, and it matters what you believe after that. All right. Now let's take rationality. The statement says everybody's rational. If you look at rationality itself as a statement, again, I don't want to go in details because of the short time, so, but just uh, think about it. So rationality is a statement that it's, it's epistemic or doxastic in nature. Because what it says, it says that each agent uh, plays, or rather doesn't play, the moves that he believes are dominated by other moves. So if he believes right, that some move ensures worse payoff than another move, then he doesn't play that one. Between any two moves, he doesn't play the one that he believes to ensure less. Success. And this depends on the agent's own beliefs. So it's a statement that deals with his beliefs. It's a statement like a Morse sentence that, has, that, uh, that involves doxastic aspects. Hence, it's a statement that uh, after you do an update, after the, somebody does any move in a game, this statement changes its truth value, may change its truth value. The meaning of rationality in the beginning and the meaning of rationality in the middle of the game is different. Because it depends on what, I mean, on what the agents currently believe rather than what they used to be. And the beliefs can change to a belief level. So that whether they are rational or not, it's not a stable thing in this sense. Right? It's, a, it's a thing that may be true now, uh, but not, uh, may be true at some point, but not others. Uh, and that's the problem. If we would require common defeasible knowledge of rationality in this sense, then that will not tell us that, uh, that after the first move they are still rational. Or that they still even believe in rationality. It will just say that no matter what happens, truthfully, they will keep believing that in the beginning they were rational. Right? But that's not the same as believing that they are rational now. That's a different thought. Right? So the fact that you are in the beginning rational given your prior beliefs, uh, doesn't imply that I believe that you are rational now, given the fact that you had to change your beliefs. So, for instance, in the beginning, it might have made sense for you to adopt a certain strategy, given what you believe. But now, I made a move, and I know you saw it, and you're forced to change your beliefs. And now, your strategy might not be rational anymore. That's a good, it's not the best answer to your current beliefs. So, that's not what you want. You do not want common knowledge in this particular sense, because that's robust only about the so to speak, the, the fixed point in time, maybe the, the, the beginning of the, of the game. Uh, it does not ensure rationality at each further stage. And uh, intuitively, for the backwards deduction argument to, to go through, what you need is that at each stage of the game, after each number of moves, from the agents have to believe now that the, that the other agents are rational now. Right? And from now on, it doesn't matter what they believe about the past. It's irrelevant. Well, it, can, it matters in a sense, but Psychologically, it doesn't really matter for the rest of the game. So what we need is an analog of defeasible knowledge that is robust in this second sense. Uh, it kind of keeps up with the dynamics. And it, the definition is exactly this characterization of defeasible knowledge in which you drop the before. So you drop the before. So you want to say something is known in this dynamic sense if no matter what truthful things you may learn during the game, you, that, that file still keeps being true, not just was true. And you keep believing that is true right then, not just it was true. So that's what we call dynamic knowledge, or stable true belief, because it's about true belief and stability of a kind, right? After any, any dynamic. It's almost indistinguishable if you put in words from the defeasible knowledge. Because yeah, five stays true and keeps being believed after any true information is issued. But it's subtly different, you see? Uh, because of the doxastic nature of five. And we apply this to rationality, which is a doxastic sentence, as I mentioned. Of course, when you apply it to atomic sentences or ontic facts, bullet and combination of atomic sentences, the, this new notion, D and the box, are the same. The dynamic knowledge is the same as box, because in that case. So, all right, this is a possible model for the centipede game. Uh, this is a plausibility model. It's not a game tree anymore. Uh, right? Each of the worlds, the, the four possible worlds, comes with an outcome, which is God knows it. 
they don't know it, but God knows the outcome. Right? So the outcome, yeah, is the whole history of the game. So if, I, if this world, O1, means essentially uh, is the world in which Alice plays down. O3 is just, you know, she plays across and around, then stops at O3. So each determines the history of the game, and the, it's not known to the agents, in the beginning at least, but these are the possible, uh, possible outcomes, and these are the possible worlds in this, in this model. The errors represent plausibility relations. So the fact that everything is correct means there is no hard information about the outcome. That's exactly opposite of Aumann's assumption. In Aumann's assumption, it follows that agents have hard information about the fact that this outcome will be realized, no, no questions. No worries. While here it's precisely the opposite. We call this assumption the epistemic openness of the future. Nobody knows at the beginning of the game what outcome will be played. Nobody has hard information. Nobody knows in the sense of K. Every outcome is possible in the sense of K. So, um, and the fact, it's, it's in, this model satisfies. There are many others, by the way, but this model satisfies because there are, all the worlds are connected by the knowledge uh, arrow, which is the arrow which should delete the, the direction. And the rest is plausibility. So for instance, in this model, the most plausible world for Boris, Serena, and Bob and is O1, which means they actually believe that they are going to play, in the beginning of the game, they believe that they are going to play the backward induction um, solution. That's what they believe. It might not be the case, but that's what they believe. By the way, you don't need strategies in the game, uh, because strategies can be encoded in this. Uh, so strategies is more than just uh, outcomes, right? Strategy is a function that at each node of the game assigns a move. Why you don't need it? Because you can encode them via plausibility relations. So, for instance, the fact that uh, the next in line after O1, the next most plausible, let's see, is O2, right? It means in terms of the game what? Let's look at the game. It means that uh, Conditionally, of, of the agent not playing a one, but rather going across, they believe that O2 would be played. So this belief is a conditional belief about what would happen at V1, right? And this is a belief by both, in this case, by both Alice and Bob. But Bob is who matters. He, he believes that if Alice doesn't play down, uh, he will play down at the next step. That's what he believes from the model. But that's exactly the notion of strategy. Right? He, this is what he believes he will do. In case, ah, ah. it will only be the case if there were no ties. No, right? If there were no ties, <coughs> if there were ties, you wouldn't get a unit. Yes. So if you are ties, then you then you don't get the notion of the standard game theory notion of strategy. You get the generalization of it, like relational strategies or non-deterministic strategies, which is like you know, at some point, some things he doesn't decide. Correct. Uh, but what I'm saying is that we don't need the strategies for analysis of the game. In a sense, we can think of strategies as just beliefs, uh, beliefs about the counterfactual future. What would happen if I ha have myself in that situation? That's, uh, that's, in a way, the interpretation of the strategies. Uh, OK. So then you see that in this model, which is the same that I had before, if you look at these uh, strategies as encoded by, uh, by plausibility uh, arrows, the strategies are exactly the backwards induction strategies. Because essentially the ordering of the nodes is O1 is the most plausible, O2 is the next most plausible, O3 is the most the next plausible, O4 is the most. So essentially this says what they believe, what, they, what their strategy currently are, are the backwards induction strategies, not just the backwards induction outcome. It's the strategy that tells you at each node further, just go down. <laughs> Which is a possibility. Of course, we can have other models in which this is not the case. Now, we model the, the, ch the a move in a game as an update. I already kind of announced this. So the moment Alice says move to moves to node v1, we interpret this as an update with the with the v1 sentence that says, well, that's it. Like that's what happened. Okay? So the words that do not satisfy v1, for instance, the O1. O1 world disappears from the model because now they know that this is not the case if this happens. That the, the future cannot be outcome O1. It has been already bypassed. Right? Uh, that's natural in a perfect information game to model, uh, to model uh, the moves as out updates because it's perfect information. So you get absolute certainty of what happened. In a poker, for instance, you'll have to go to something less than updates because you don't know exactly. You have beliefs about what happened, but you don't see exactly everything.
So essentially, the theorem is the following. We assume two things. We assume, well, three things. We assume, as usual in game theory, that the gain is known. So the structure of the game, the moves, the outcomes, the fails, are common knowledge in the sense of k, irrevocable knowledge. So that's like they're good given. That's, that's the game. Of course, you can relax this, but it's not really necessary for you. It's like not, sure, not being sure what game you are playing. So that's a different thing. Furthermore, we assume that, the, uh, assume that the future is epistemically open, which is nobody has hard information in the sense of k of the outcome. Every outcome is consistent in the beginning of the game. That's almost the opposite of Alma's assumption, but it seems uh, much more realistic. Right? So it's like the future is not determined, up, at least up to my knowledge. It might be determined, that, I mean, God might know it, but not. Uh, and it has to do, if you like, with the fact that rational agents cannot predict their own actions. Right? So the, as long as there are rational agents engaged in, in, in a decision process, they have to do decisions. A decision <coughs> problem makes sense if the agent is free to choose this or that, if there is some kind of uncertainty about that. If they are certain that this will be chosen, then there is no decision to be done. There is no. And furthermore, the, the third condition that replaces common knowledge of rationality is this common dynamic knowledge of what we call dynamic rationality. And dynamic rationality is rationality from now on, as in the optimist idea. Like, not about the past, but rationality at this moment and in the future. So that common dynamic knowledge is like, is like at every moment of the game, you have that stable true belief that from now on, now and in the future, the agent will be rational. And these three together imply the backward induction solution. So this is one possible solution to the, to the, um, to the uh, more realistic one, to the problem of justifying this solution concept in game theory. By the way, there are other, um, there are other ways to deal with this issue. So Johann van Bentham uh, has a way that um, is very similar to the way we treated the surprise examination. Uh, essentially, he tries to build this common whatever kind of knowledge of rationality uh, uh, by uh, updates or upgrades with, rational, with a sentence saying rationality. So uh, his idea is not about what happens in the game, like what our analysis is, but what, so to speak, happens offline, before the game. Like how do people arrive to have some, some kind of common belief or common dynamic knowledge or common strong belief of rationality? Well, they do it by, well, some kind of learning or updating with rationality. And one time is not enough. Because of the fact that I mentioned that rationality is a doxastic concept, after you announce people, like in the Madi everybody, everybody here is rational, uh, it might still be the case that now, given this information, they, they, their strategies become bad. So they are irrational now. So then you have to announce them again, if it's the case. Everybody is irrational, and then again, and then again. And at the limit, in the limit, you converge to, depending on the up, what do you do, updates, upgrades, what kind of upgrade, you converge to one of these solutions in the literature, either common, no, strong, uh, irrevocable knowledge of rationality, like Alman, or uh, common defe defeasible dynamic knowledge of rationality, like us, or common strong belief of rationality, which is another solution concept proposed by uh, Batigali and Siskaj. So I invite you to look at the, at the uh, slides on the website, because I will not, uh, I don't have time anymore for this. Uh, and this is concludes my uh, our course. Uh, we announced more, but um, we, there was no way to get to um, things like questions and uh, inference steps uh, dealing with logical issues. So for this, you'll have to uh, look on the web or ask us uh, questions further. Thank you.